She received her doctorate in biology from Tulane University. Following graduation, she was awarded an NIH postdoctoral training grant fellowship in vision research. She is the parent of a child recovering from autism and a health educator, biomedical consultant for families of autistic children. Dr. Underwood is a senior staff scientist for SSAI, Inc., supporting NASA. She is a Center for Autism and Related Disorders IRB board member and has appeared in many peer-reviewed journals. So please welcome Dr. Underwood. Okay, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me if I do that? Can you hear me if I do that? I'm good. <laughs> Um, first, I wanted to take the time to thank the conference organizers. Uh, you guys are so fortunate to have such a wonderful, uh, you know, array of different professionals presenting different types of therapies and interventions. I wish when my child was diagnosed that I had had that opportunity. I had to travel miles away to meet actually some of my best friends that I have today to get so much of the information that you guys are getting today. Um, I'm starting a little bit early because I have a lot of information to cover. I've actually bared down my talk a lot because really, realistically, to go over everything I need to go over, it's an hour and a half talk. I do talk a little bit fast, but I'm worried I'm not going to cover everything. Uh, so I'll, I'll do my best when I get to the technical information to slow down a little bit and try not to get too sidetracked with stories. And, and just a little bit about me, obviously I got involved with all of this because I have a child on the spectrum also. You know, when you, you think about life when you're a child growing up and you think about, you know, I'm going to meet the love of my life and I'm going to get married and I'm going to have great friends and I'm going to get a great job. And part of that is not, I want to have a child with autism. You don't think, wow, I want to have a child with autism. It is one of the most challenging situations to be in, not alone having one child with autism. I know families who have multiple children with autism. It's a very challenging, frustrating situation to be in. But, you know, by being here today, by coming to this conference, making time, um, that was one of the things that um, Marianne said yesterday during the opening presentation, making time to do something about it. You know, you, you need to be the best advocate for your child. So I congratulate all of you for coming here today to educate yourselves about what you can do to improve the quality of your child's life, your family's life, and the people who are involved with you and your child. So um, on that, I guess I will, hmm, I might begin, maybe. <laughs> So I'm going to go over like a brief overview of what autism is. Obviously, all of you know that because you wouldn't be at this conference today if for some reason, you know, there wasn't somebody in your life that has autism. I, I like to pull the audience just to have an idea of who I'm talking to. When you were growing up as a child, how many people knew somebody who had autism? And everybody look around the room, like three people, right? So how many today sitting in this room know somebody with autism? Right, so I mean, that speaks for itself. Clearly, something is going on. I mean, and the good news is that, you know, the scientists are looking to try to find out what is the cause, what is the trigger. And, you know, today, there's a lot more information out there than was available when my child was diagnosed. And the other thing that I did want to mention, like I said, nobody asked for this. You know, we didn't dream of this. But I have to tell you, the people that I've met along this journey are some of the most important people in my life today, and I don't know what I would do without them. I, and I wouldn't have met them had my child not developed autism. So, you know, be aware of the really special people that you will meet along this journey. It might not be somebody in this room, it might be the person sitting next to you right now, but I'm telling you that the most special people, the most important people, the people who I connect on every single level are part of my life now because of autism. So think about that as, you know, you're going down this, this incredibly challenging journey. So today what I'm going to do is do an overview of why behavioral interventions are important um, and why biomedical interventions are important and why you have to take both these things into consideration. I'm sorry, I think I had way too much coffee. So I've already said that. And what I'm going to do too is I'm going to explain some basic science to you. Because if you don't understand how the body works, you're not going to understand what goes wrong. 
So once you have that concept in that mind, both you know, by learning and with visual stimulation, because I'm going to show you pictures of how things can go wrong, you can have a better understanding of why and how biomedical interventions make a difference. Like how many people in here are scientists? Right. I, I mean, how many people are, you know, have a background in biochemistry? You know, one, right. And you're expected to hear, you know, things about transulfuration, methylation, how these things are going to affect your child when you don't even know what, it's just this word, it's this thing. So you have to have an idea of what that is so that you can understand why treating with things like supplements will make a difference. So hopefully I'm going to help enlighten you in that a little bit. So like I said, I'm going to explain how the body system works and then what can go wrong. So everybody's here because they know what autism is. Um, it's a developmental disability. And I like to show this, and, I, and this is when I wish I had my, my pointer because this thing drives me nuts. But this painting over here is done by an artist. Um, his name is Paul Foppel, and he does different artistic uh, present representations, paintings and drawings and things like that. And the money that he makes from the artwork, he donates to that particular organization. And what's really interesting about this, this painting says something like 92,000 days in solitary confinement and still counting. And that's just so moving to me because these kids are trapped inside their bodies and we need to help get them out. We know that in many cases it's true. When we heard Dr. Um, Herbert give that talk yesterday about that 35-year-old woman who underwent anesthesia and then... You know, when she came out, she had this conversation, she had never been verbal, and had this conversation with her mom, you know, for like 20 minutes. How does that happen? You know, somebody else told me that, uh, you know, somebody, they, they had a change in altitude. This kid was totally nonverbal, and they, they sang a song, and they'd never spoken before in their lives. How does that happen? And hopefully I'll have the time at the end of my talk. I have an uh, interview that was conducted with a completely nonverbal child. His parents found out at the age of 14 that he could communicate with facilitated communication. Was not, not so many people believe in that kind of thing because you have to actually help the child with their hand on the computer keys. But what's real interesting is that if you went to Stephen Shore's talk yesterday, he said that, you know, and it's real interesting hearing him talk from an autistic person's perspective, is that he said it takes so much thought to actually write with a pencil that that's why sometimes many autistic children can't or use the computer. But anyway, somebody was able to interview this child, and the answers to the questions about autism are just, they're, they're just extremely enlightening. So hopefully I'll get everything through and I'll be able to read this at the very end. And I'd like to show this picture because these are the things that we don't see. We don't see pointing, we don't see smiling, we don't see reaching out. These are normal developmental milestones that your child, it's essential for them to hit so that you have normal behavioral development. And again, you've heard this before. Um, it affects communication skills, social skills, and behavioral act interactions. You know, you don't see these types of play-like behaviors among children with autism. And then the other thing is, is that sometimes you have a period of normal development, and other times it's like, you know, something that suddenly happens somewhere between two to three months. And the other thing that's really tricky, and you've heard plenty of this, is that no two children are affected the same way. And again, as Martha said yesterday, when you meet one child or person with autism, you've met one person or child with autism. Uh, they act completely differently, they respond completely differently, and interventions are, are, can be implemented dif completely differently. And again, these are just some of the behavioral issues that I'm sure you're all familiar with, self-injurious behavior, um, having no fear of danger, not wanting to be touched, um, inappropriate giggling and laughing, all these types of things are abnormal behaviors that we are trying to move the children away from with behavioral interventions. And again, the tough part is that there is no definitive cure. And if you go to a physician and says, I have a cure for you, that is not true. But there are treatments. And that's why you're here today, to learn about the treatments. OK, so why behavioral and biomedical interventions? Because many children suffer from real comorbid medical conditions. Many of these children are actually really sick, and they deserve to have the same medical treatment 
for anything that is ailing them as a normal or neurotypical child. And if you treat these conditions that they have, they will be more receptive to whatever intervention that you decide to implement. So the best treatment overall, and what I'm going to try to convey to you today, is a balance between both of these things. So, and I'm going to explain why you need to do behavioral interventions, because you don't have a period of normal development. You have those abnormal behaviors developing over time. So this way, you can review some of these things, you can educate yourselves, and choose what type of thing that you want to do for your child. Okay, so this is what we're talking about when we're talking about development. When a child goes through development, you have to hit these milestones. When you go to the pediatrician, they have a little chart, and they mark off not only their height, their weight, their measurements, their, their head measurements, but certain developmental, you know, they ask you, is your baby smiling, is your baby waving, you know, they'll actually, or they won't even ask, they'll do those things during your normal well baby checkup. And if these things don't happen, those should be red flags for you, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with that because that's why you're here today. Please bear in mind that if your child is talking and is developing and there is any period of time where there's a loss of language, that also is a red flag. So why are behavioral interventions necessary? Well, look at these kids. You know, I don't walk around the street going like this, right? That little boy there, he's not sitting and interacting with the other kids. The other kid, you know, is lining up his trucks and looking at him out of the corner of his eye. I mean, those are not normal play behaviors. And this is like a funny cartoon. I don't get it. You, you don't sit, you don't beg, you don't give your paw, and yet they still feed you. So you can be different, and, but you can still be, you know, accepted. And I, I, I want to say that because there was something really interesting that was brought up yesterday. You know, is it bad to have autism? Well, okay, yes, you want to have bowel control. You don't want your child incontinence. And, but many of these children, you know, do have gifts. And just because they're different, is that bad? You know, it, we have to learn to accept what we have and help them be the best person that they are and help develop the gifts that they have. In many cases, many of these children do. Okay, why consider behavioral therapy? Because autism, as you've heard, is based upon behaviors. It's not a medically based diagnosis. When you go to your pediatrician, it's a psychiatric, psychological diagnosis, sometimes made between 18 and 24 months, although many physicians, you know, are a little wary. They can say, you know, some children talk late. You might not get your diagnosis until, uh, three years old. But what's important to realize is that a tremendous amount of neurological development is going on during that period. Between 18 and 20, from zero to 18 to 24 months, a tremendous amount of developmental milestones are being met. And if you miss those, you can't go back in time. You can't just wind back the, top, the clock and hit all, you have to go through those developmental milestones to become you know, the, the human or what we consider the human condition that we are today. And so it's real interesting when people say they start to do like maybe behavioral interventions or biomedical interventions, she's like, you know, my kid's babbling. I'm like, what does a newborn baby do? A newborn baby babbles. They don't come out of the womb and just say, hi mom, how are you? They babble, then they repeat words. Echolalia is actually what, you know, young children when they start to learn to talk actually do before they start learning to string things together. You have to keep these things in mind. You're like, I need to go through these developmental milestones. I need to get babbling. I need to get echolalia. I need to get, you know, stringing one and two words together to get to the point where I'm having some sort of expressive language. And I'm not saying either one of these children are or are not autistic. But when you look at this 18-month-old, you can look clear. Th that baby has clear eyes and is looking right at you. And this one, you know, this just doesn't quite look right. Now, I'm not saying this child has autism, but I'm reminding you guys of red flags, of symptoms, of things to look at when you look at your child that tells you maybe something is going on here. I do want to mention one other thing, though. If, if you can think about, you know, assessing your child early, the earlier that you do do biomedical interventions, you know, the increase outcomes of success. I mean, the younger you treat these children, the more likely you have better success. 
Okay, and so you've heard several different type of therapies. Um, there's a lot of different type of behavioral therapy interventions. And um, this is a really good question. And when I heard this question, I was like, I don't know, I think I should know the answer to that. So does anybody have any idea what the number one behavioral therapy for autism is? I didn't know the answer either. <laughs> the one that the family chooses. You will hear about different types of interventions. You will hear about things like ABA, RDI, TEACH. Um, all of these programs are excellent programs. All of these programs look towards reducing the negative aberrant behaviors that were, was on that chart at the very beginning and increasing acceptable behaviors so that these kids, the children can optimize their development and go through some of these developmental milestones. And so you'll hear about all different types of behavioral interventions. They're different types. They're geared to different types of family lifestyles. Educate yourselves about the different ones that are out there and see which one works the best for you and your family. You know, some people, you know, their house is a wreck. They can't keep tidy. That's kind of like me. You know, maybe they'd be better with like a floor time kind of play therapy where you get in there with them. And then other people, you know, they like everything just so. Everything, you know, has to be on a schedule. You know, maybe those people do better with ABA. It, it just, it, you have to think about what works best for your family lifestyle. Because, again, autism just doesn't affect the child. It affects the whole family and people who interact with the family. And basically, like, that's what I said. You want to reduce inappropriate behaviors, reduce self stimulatory behaviors, anything that can impede the learning process so that they can learn. And then um, if anybody had gone to hear Stephen Schroer's lecture the other day, um, you want to consider other interventions too, center, sensory innervation, um, you, because for whatever reason, sometimes things that touch their bodies affect them differently than the way they affect you and I. Uh, Stephen was saying something about he has to wear loosely fitting clothes because just the thought of feeling that against his skin just distracts him so much that he can't think about anything that anybody's saying to him. Or, you know, the lights overhead. You know, he, he hears that, that, that like, uh, high-pitched sound or the actual beam of the light distracts him so much that he just can't concentrate. You have to take these other things into consideration, too. And again, why behavioral intervention? Because uh, many kids take things really, really literally. When they get to the point where they're understanding what you're talking about, this is really funny too. Don't look right now, but that guy over there is giving you the eye. Well, you know, they think literally. This cartoon is like the guy's taking his eye out and like handing it to somebody. You can say things like, you know, can you take that ladder and, um, or hold the door, right? They'll think they want to pick up the door. You know, a lot of times during their thought process, they take things really, really literally. So that's why you have to do all these types of interventions to teach them how we behave and react to the environment around us. Okay, um, why is there uh, an overlap between behavior and biomedical interventions? Because if there are existing comorbid conditions, if the kids don't feel well, that can impede any kind of intervention that you're going to do. Okay, so you're going to spend money on ABA, right? We have all this money laid out to do this. If they're sick and not responding, you might as well just flush your money down the toilet. You go and drive to have auditory integration therapy. You pay like whatever, $5,000 for a week. If they're not feeling well that week, $5,000 down the toilet. If they're not healthy and you're putting out all this money to do these behavioral interventions, the response that you're going to get may not be as optimal as you would like. And when it comes to spending this kind of money, you want to get the best bang for your bunk. You want your kid to feel the best that they can so they can respond to these therapies. Okay, so why consider a biomedical approach to treatment? Okay, now we understand why you have to do behavioral because they've gone through this long period of abnormal behavior. So we have to kind of go back, help them go through de developmental milestones, and teach you know, appropriate behaviors and reduce the negative behaviors. Um, biomedical is the application of science to medicine. So there's a lot of science and research going on that is explaining what's going on with these kids. And so what I'd like to take from this is that autism is a whole system of things going on with these kids, all interacting at different levels, all interacting different amounts and different ways. 
And it might not be one, it might be a couple, it might be all of them, but it's possible for any number of these things to impact your child's life. And what I tell parents is when they go to get their child treated, a lot of times, you know, you can't necessarily find somebody who's willing to talk to you about you know, alternative or biomedical interventions. There are two papers that are published through the American Academy of Pediatrics. And within the contents of these papers, they talk about alternative treatments like diet, secretin, chelation therapy. Uh, they talk about also the behavioral interventions. Bring it to your doctor and say, please, read this for me. Humor me. You know, I, I want to maybe think about doing some of these things with my child. When I went to my pediatrician, I was sure that my child had some issues with milk. I'm like, will you just, you know, can we just please, this, this paper wasn't published yet. Could we do some allergy testing? No, your child doesn't look like she has allergies. Go home, I'm like, still has a runny nose, still, you know, just sick all the time, constantly having to take antibiotics. I'm like, just please, you know, could, could we just run just a simple, like, you know, food allergy test, not the prick test, I wanted to do the, the blood test. And they said no. I went back a third time. I'm like, can you? And so finally she was just sick of me. She was like, okay, fine, I'll do it. And sure enough, the blood test came back because you know, I, at the time, not a lot of people were doing these things and I needed to convince my family that I was gonna do this alternative diet and this was why. And sure enough, there showed a tremendous allergy to milk. When I removed milk from her diet, all of a sudden it was like she came out of this fog. Her nose quit running. Um, she just kind of like seemed lucid at, the, at that time. So, you know, I had to be real persistent. I had to advocate for myself. You at least have something to bring to your physician to advocate for yourself. On top of that, if you go to somebody and they're just not nice, they're ugly, you know, go somewhere else. You don't have to stay with that doctor. There's no rule that says that you have to stay with that doctor. And there's no rule that says that they know everything. You know, you know more about your child than anybody else. You're the one at the end of the day that has to go home with that child. If you and your gut feel like anything that they're telling you, you don't agree with, you know, go see somebody else. You don't, you don't have to stay with that person. And there are compassionate alternative you know, not even, they don't even have to be alternative, but there are compassionate healthcare providers who will be willing to work with you. They're out there. Um, I'm, I'm gonna go through these. So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over some basic anatomy so that you guys understand what's going on and what can go wrong, okay? So you've heard a lot of things about doing the diet. You've heard a lot of things about things like intestinal dysbiosis, which I'm gonna explain about. But if you don't understand how the digestive tract functions, these things are just gonna be like meaningless words that come out to you. And if you don't remember your you know, biology from high school or from college, then you know, all, all these great things that people are telling you are just kind of like really abstract. So I want you to understand what happens when you eat food. Okay, you have a digestive system. You ingest food through your mouth, it gets into your stomach, partial digestion begins there, then you go to the small intestine and you have an absorption of nutrients there and there are three part of the small intestines that you need to know about. And again, this is like when I wish I really had the pointer. But um, okay, so you eat food, goes to your stomach, from the stomach, goes into this, this kind of coily area here, the small intestine, and there's three parts. The first part is the duodenum, the second part is the jejunum, and the third part is the ileum. Now I'm telling you that because if you've ever read anything that Dr. Andy Wakefield talks about, he talks about a condition called ileonodular hyperplasia. Well, if you have no idea where the ileum is in the body, it's, it's like, what is that? I have no idea where that is. So it's in the third part of the small intestine where you're absorbing nutrients, the ileum, nodular is talking to lymph nodes that are there, hyperplasia mean increased swelling. So you've got swelling in the third part of the small intestines. Then you have the colon where you have increased absorption of water, rectum where things are voided, the liver which helps with detoxification, and the pancreas which secretes digestive enzymes so that you digest your foods so that you have the nutrients to absorb. And again, I just basically went through all that. Okay, and so how do you get nutrients from your food? So we understand we eat food, gets in, it's digested, they're broken down, they're absorbed, to get to the cells of your body so you can have proper cell function. Foods are made up of proteins. When they're eaten and they're digested properly, these proteins, which you think of as long chains, are broken down by enzymes, okay? And you have to have these proper enzymes to release so that these proteins are broken up. 
These proteins are broken down into polypeptides, which are further broken down into peptides, which are further broken down into amino acids. And then if you remember anything from your biochemistry class that you might have taken or chemistry class, amino acids are the building blocks of life. They are essential for proper cell function. If you are not getting proper nutrition from the foods that you are eating, you will not get the amino acids that every single cell in your body needs to function properly, whether it's your cell in your liver, the cell in your kidneys, the cells, any cell, the cells in your brain, any cells in your body. Okay, so we understand about proper digestion. What can go wrong? Now, I think you've also heard some terms being thrown out there, um, intestinal dysbiosis, uh, something called leaky gut. You know, I remember the first time I had heard somebody speak and they said leaky gut. I'm like, wait, that can't be right. You know, I thought everything's got to stay in there and if it leaks out, don't you get septic? And you know, that just seems like a really bad term. It is a really bad term. And I know there's a lot of stuff on this slide, but what leaky gut really means is an increase in intestinal permeability. Within the, this long tube that coils all the way around through your digestive system, inside are folds. And the, what lines these folds are individual cells. And these cells line up next to each other and protect provide a protective barrier between what goes into your stomach, what goes through to your digestive system, and what is filtered out into your body. It is supposed to be permeable. Nutrients are supposed to, or your amino acids are supposed to permeate out and get into your bloodstream and get to the cells that need it. It is supposed to be permeable. When you have what they refer to as leaky gut, you have an increase an abnormal increase in intestinal permeability, and things are able to leak out that shouldn't or might not necessarily be able to. And this can happen, I will go over through a couple things, but swelling, inflammation, hyperplasia can affect how these cells line up next to each other and affect what permeates out. And things like Foods, like if your foods aren't being broken down properly, or parts or components can leak out, get into the bloodstream, and be recognized as foreign by the immune system, which is bad. Okay, the second thing that can go wrong with the gut is dysbiosis. Okay, your GI tract has tens of thousands of flora that are supposed to be there. They're an integral part of your entire digestive system. And there is a balance between you know, good bacteria and flora that's supposed to be there and bad. And your immune system knows how to keep that in check. When you talk about intestinal dysbiosis, you're talking about the natural flora that's there overgrows. It goes out of control. Like we all have yeast. Everybody has yeast. It's ubiquitous throughout your body. But when something happens and you end up with something disrupting the balance of the normal flora in your GI tract, you end up with something called intestinal dysbiosis. And this can result from antibiotics, from a poor diet, too much sugar in your diet, stress, and something called immune system dysregulation, where the immune system isn't properly functioning. And this is a funny cartoon, too. This is a woman who's gone in to see her doctor, and she says she's got, chronic, I think, chronic fatigue syndrome or something like that. And uh, the doctor's like, no, there has nothing to do with that. Just accept that you'll be on antidepressants for the rest of your life, and you'll be fine. But yet this woman has major bloating going on. She has something physically happening to her, and he's just like, no, you'll be fine. Just take these drugs and go home. Okay, and so what kind of things can happen to your GI tract when you have intestinal dysbiosis? You can have constipation, diarrhea, and you can have enterocolitis. And everybody talks about poop. Everybody talks about poop. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, everybody talks about it, but do you really know what's supposed to happen? <laughs> You're supposed to have one normal formed bowel movement a day. That is normal. You're not supposed to have 12. You're not supposed to have 15. They're not supposed to be watery. They're not supposed to be squishy. They're supposed to have the consistency of Play-Doh. If there's anything does not sound like what the poop looks like that you see, it's a possibility that something is wrong. And enterocolitis, when I was talking about uh, the ileonodular hyperplasia, um, it's an inflammation 
or an irritation of some part of the intestinal lining. This is what a normal part of the third part of the small intestine should look like. It's smooth, it's clear, it doesn't look irritated. And this is what it looks like when you have something called ileonodular hyperplasia. You, and I like to give this great analogy. You know when you have tonsillitis? You take the flashlight, you look in your throat, you're like, oh my gosh, look how swollen my tonsils are. And your neck hurts, and you know, your throat might be sore. Well, this type of reaction is happening in the third part of some of these children's small intestine. This was from a, a scope that was done. So think about it, OK? Your GI tract is 30 feet long. And then if you unwind all of the surface area of that, it's almost the equivalent of a football field. That's how much surface area that we're talking about. And say that it's red and irritated and inflamed. OK, now wait. OK, I told you how long the AGI tract. It's huge, right? When you go to the beach and you get sunburnt, right, how much do you whine? Oh, my sunburn. It hurts. My shoulders hurt. My back hurt. My arm. Put some cream on, right? You're in so, it hurts. Well, imagine if you have that same feeling inside and you can't tell anybody. What are you going to do? Are you going to act out? Are you going to scream? Are you going to bite? Are you gonna, you're, you're going to do something behaviorally to convey to somebody that you're in pain. So what happens if you have problems with your GI tract? The nutrients and vitamins that you need to get from your food aren't going to be properly absorbed. You can get food allergies, you can have detoxification issues, all kinds of things that can affect normal bodily functions of the systems of your body. Okay, and what's the third thing that can happen in the GI tract? You can get allergy, you can get an allergic reaction to foods. Um, I wanted to tell the difference between an allergy and a food sensitivity. And you want to think about having allergy in the GI tract, because actually a large part of the immune system is located in the GI tract. Because it's the first line of defense about anything coming out that shouldn't get into your body. So a food allergy is a true immune system response. So remember, like I talked about that blood test, if you were to do a blood test, an IgE blood test, that is telling you whether you have a true food allergy response. And what happens is your body confuses the food for something that it's supposed to attack and produces antibodies against it. And again, this can be as mild as getting a rash, you can get boils, you can go into anaphylactic shock, it could be that serious. That's the range of allergic reactions. Now, food sensitivity is something different. But again, many of these children also suffer from food sensitivities too. It's not an immune system response. It's something in the food irritates the GI tract. And this is similar to somebody who's like lactose intolerant. Uh, they can't break down that protein, and so they end up with gas and bloating and irritation because that particular pro that protein irritates their GI tract. So as I said, there's a balance between infection and immunity. Your immune system keeps everything in check so that you don't end up with like intestinal dysbiosis or so that you don't end up having an allergic reaction to things like foods that you shouldn't normally be having. The immune system is supposed to protect, never do any harm. It's supposed to have memory, get smarter. That's why you get vaccinated. It remembers what you've been, a small amount of whatever viral or bacterium that you've been exposed to, so that when it's exposed to it again, it knows immediately to react to it. That's the whole point of doing that. It responds appropriate, meaning it attacks when it's supposed to attack, and it ignores when it's supposed to ignore, and it's supposed to do no harm. So things can go wrong with your immune system. If it doesn't do those things, you can end up with a hypersensitivity to things. You can end up with autoimmunity, where your body actually attacks itself. That's similar to what happens with people who have MS. That's an autoimmune disease. And the body attacks the myelin sheath that surround the nerve cells of the body and affects nervous conduction. You can end up with inflammation, any kind of inflammation. Inflammation in the face, inflammation in the GI tract and you can end up with immune system dysregulation. And again, the immune system not reacting properly. Yeah. And what happens when the immune system doesn't react properly is that you can form allergic reactions to things that you necessarily wouldn't respond to, like foods. And so what happens if your immune system is compromised, if it's not reacting properly? Uh, 
you get a chronic inflammation, autoimmune reactions, but what's most important, the things that I just said, is that it's closely connected to every other system of the body. And if there are problems with the immune system, you can guarantee that there'll be other problems with the body and you end up with some sort of disease or health condition. Okay, so I'm gonna go over a little bit about biochemistry because I think it's really important to understand detoxification and how important that is. And I believe that, um, oh, who spoke yesterday? It was uh, Dr. Pangborn talked a little bit about the methylation cycle. And, you know, it, it took me the longest time to really get a grasp on that. But there's some really key important points that you need to understand to understand why you would consider supplementing with things like B12. Everybody's talking about B12. People are talking about B6. People are talking about DMG. People are talking about glutathione. But if, again, if you don't understand why these are important from basically a biochemistry level, then it, it, it's kind of hard to just wrap your mind around the whole concept. Okay, so detoxification takes place in the liver. And if you look at this slide here, it's a two-step process. And if you look at some of the cofactors that are responsible for this two-step process, there are some of the uh, you know, vitamins and compounds that have been talked about so far. Step one makes a toxic substance less toxic. Step two makes it water soluble so that you can excrete it from your body. And all these things have to be there so you can have proper detoxification. So if that function is compromised, what's going to happen? Detoxification is going to have a problem. So detoxification involves two chemical processes, methylation and transsulfuration. And so what the suggestion is, is that children with autism don't have the raw materials that they need to drive these two reactions. So you supplement to bypass these inadequacies, inadequacies so that these reactions can take place. So, okay. We can take the bull by the horns because you're going to get this. I'm not going to go over this slide, but I want you to visually think in your mind that this is what's happening in every cell of the body, okay? So I'm not going to talk to the slide, but I like this as a visual to think of this is what's happening in the cell. Okay, now if you look at some things here, what do you see? You see TMG, you see B6, you see glutathione, okay? This pathway is tremendously important part of detoxification. Okay, we're going to start here at the top for the production of something called glutathione. And glutathione is the garbage truck of your body. That's what your body needs to get rid of toxins. It links up onto it and it helps your body get rid of it. So if this chemical pathway isn't taking place properly and you don't produce enough glutathione, your body is going to have issues detoxifying. Okay, so how do we get glutathione? Okay, well, through our diet, we get something called methionine. Methionine is an amino acid, and you cannot supplement with methionine. You have to get it from your diet. Now, what's critically important about this particular amino acid is that when you go through this reaction, you get methyl groups that are donated for DNA synthesis, which is very important for cell function. After that, it is metabolized to something called homocysteine. Okay, this intermediate is then metabolized with a methyl group from this reaction here, I'll go here in a second, to recycle methionine because it's such an important amino acid. Okay, that's one thing that happens. The other thing that happens with methionine is homocysteine is metabolized with a cofactor B6 to cysteine to give you glutathione, okay? So one, it's remethylated to methionine. I mean, um, methionine is remethylated and methionine produces glutathione. And again, because it's so important to have methionine, there are two pathways to recycle or produce methionine. The other way is with the folic acid pathway. You get folic acid, again, from your diet. It is metabolized with an enzyme called methotetrahydrofolate reductase. You need that enzyme to be functioning properly. To methyl tetrahydrofolate, it gives up its methyl group to, vitamin, to B12, the active form of B12 is methyl B12 because you need that methyl group to interact with this enzyme, methionine synthase, to recycle homocysteine to methionine. Okay, so there are some important things that have to happen. 
One, these enzymes, and these are not like the enzymes that I'm talking about when you eat food. These enzymes are like the gas that drives your car. These enzymes have to be functioning to make that chemical reaction take place. So there is research that's shown that there are issues with those enzymes in children with autism and that they don't function as properly as in a normal person. And if they don't, that means that you're not getting your methyl group, sorry, you're not getting your methyl group from this folate pathway to give, to have the active form of methyl B12 to recycle homocysteine if these two enzymes aren't functioning properly. Now the other issue to think about is if you're not breaking down your foods properly and if you're not getting the amino acids and nutrients that you need from your foods, you will not get the cofactors, the B6 and the B12 and the folic acid to drive these reactions. So what do you do? You, you bypass the body's inability to get these by supplementing. Okay, I got 15 minutes, so I'm going to keep going. So I hope you understand. You would supplement to make these reactions take place so that you can produce glutathione, so that your body can detoxify. And I'm not saying that this process doesn't happen. It does. Uh, just like these cars are driving someplace, you know, in the snow to get to some location, you know, they're still going to get there. It's just going to take a lot longer. And the same thing is with this pathway. It's not that this pathway doesn't take place. It's not as efficient, and it's going to take longer. And so how do you treat biomedically? You look for a physician or healthcare provider who's willing to look for you. And again, no single treatment works for any child. And to educate yourself like you are being here today. So if you improve immune function and if you improve digestive function, the kids are going to feel better and they're going to be more responsive. They'll socialize more. They'll talk more. They'll be more, they'll be more with it. Okay, and I'm going to go through these quickly because it's really important for me to get to the slides at the end, and there's really something that I want to read with you. And you've already heard some people talk about some basic biomedical interventions, primarily diet. A lot of these kids don't eat healthy. You know, some of them just eat potato chips. Some people just eat McDonald's french fries. That's not healthy. You're not going to get nutrition that you need from that. Um, you know, and people say, you know, but that's all my kid will eat. They won't eat anything else. But if you read some of the labels on some of these things and educate yourself as to what's in there, you can make smarter choices about what goes into your child's mouth. And again, this, this just cracked me up. I mean, <laughs> why don't they just say that in the labels, you know? Give them fruity pebbles and they'll go bouncing off the walls, you know? Even though you think you're doing a good thing because you're buying them cereal, you know, maybe you shouldn't go for the fruity pebbles or the cocoa puffs. And believe me, I'm just as bad. I buy that sometimes too. And there are lots of diets. And again, you have to research them yourself. Try to figure out what would make sense to you. Observe your child. Keep a daily diary. And people say doing a diet could be hard. I'm like, but you know, although at the beginning it could seem really difficult, but isn't it better to try the diet and end up with any kind of diet, even a healthier diet, end up with a happier, healthier child than a poor functioning one? OK, and why supplement nutritionally? Again, um, nutritional deficiency means you're lacking a nutrient that you get from the foods you eat. And it can occur because of malabsorption, irritation in the GI tract, unhealthy eating. And if you have nutritional deficiencies, you can get oxidative stress, and it causes stress on the cells, disease. And I want you to think about it. There are nutritional deficiencies that are associated with disease. Think about beriberi. Think about um, a goiter, iodine deficiency. Think about scurvy. These are known diseases that occur because vitamins or nutrients are missing from the body. So it's not that obscure to say that some of these kids are nutritionally defi de deficient and that we need to supplement so that they are not ill. And some of the signs and symptoms associated with nutritional deficiency, I'm not going to read all these, but read them. And what does that remind you of? Does that remind you a little bit of what autism is like? And again, why detoxify? Because if toxins de build up in your body, you know, the cells of your body get sick, the cells of your body can even die. If your cells aren't functioning properly, your organs and tissues of your body aren't going to function properly, you're going to end up with body system problems and disease. If you detoxify, your cells can recover and heal. 
And how does your body detoxify? You need glutathione, right? We got that from the slide. You need glutathione. You can supplement with glutathione to help build up what you have in your body. You can, uh, I think it's available orally. Uh, they say the orb absorption isn't as great through the GI tract. Uh, you can get it compounded into a transdermal preparation that you can absorb through your skin. And there are some physicians who do IV glutathione. Um, you can also do hyperbaric chamber treatments. You can do chelation therapy. There are lots of ways to help detoxify the body. Okay, so now this is what's really important. I want to give you visual cues. So I've told you what can go wrong. I've told you what happens developmentally. But I want you to see in your mind these things. Because it could be happening right in your own house. It could be happening right in your own therapy session, and you don't necessarily see it. I'm equally victim of that. Uh, I will show pictures of the end of my child. And at one point, there's almost like there's a Bell's palsy going on in one side of the face that I just, I didn't notice. You're so caught up in your day-to-day -day life, in your requirements, in your job, in the family, in the shopping, in the cleaning. And, you know, it's sometimes hard to step back and look at what's going on. Okay, so first off, warning signs, any change in behavior. You know, if they flap all the time, okay, that's fine. You know, that you know what your child's normal behavior is all the time. Or if they pace back and forth all the time, that's what they do. But if they start becoming really, really hyper or really, really sleepy or all of a sudden develop rashes, these should be red flags for you that maybe something inside of them is going wrong. And this is why biomedical and behavioral interventions go hand in hand. Okay, if a child suffers from allergy, focus and attention can be affected. Okay, I don't know if anybody here has allergies, but when your eyes are itchy and your nose is runny you can't, and you, your head's kind of like, you know, in a fog, can you think and concentrate when you sit at your desk at work? You know, are you at your best when you're suffering from allergies? No, you're not. You can't concentrate that well. What if you have GI distress? Cramping, bloating, okay? Same thing. If you eat something foul, you know, and you, your stomach starts cramping up, think about how much pain that puts you in, you know? Are you going to sit there and, you know, finish a report, answer email? No, you know, you want to go sit in the corner and crawl in a ball and rock, right? Um, so cramping, all these things are like signs and symptoms. You know, if they're crying, if they're doing weird posturing behaviors, if they just seem miserable, you know, maybe something is wrong. And again, immune system issues. If they seem to be getting sick all the time, like I said, you know, I felt like I was always going back because we always had a sinus infection. Um, you know, it can cause pain, it can cause distress. It can... And the other thing, these kids have sensory issues. What if they have rashes? That rash may feel like, you know, just tax on their skin as opposed to like how it feels to us. And if you were constantly obsessing and thinking about that, how can you concentrate on anything else? How can you do an ABA session, you know? How can you do any kind of play therapy? How can you interact with anybody when you're that uncomfortable? And again, biochemical pathways can be interrupted. They can be overstimulated or understimulated. They could be like wired and crazy, or they can just be lethargic and just lay there and apathetic. And if you have detoxifications, again, this can affect attention and focus. They can also develop sound sensitivities. You know, they can just kind of seem spaced out because all these toxins are building up in their body and it's affecting all their cell functions and they're just kind of out of it. They're just kind of zoned out. They don't feel good. And if these things continue, you, it's just going to keep self-propagating. If you're not going to deal with any of the underlying problems, it's going to continue to affect normal cell function. And again, these are just different things for you to look at that your child does. You know, they grab their stomach, they bend over, they bend backwards, they feel ill. I think that's what that little boy is doing. And what's interesting about this is that this is a dog that is suffering from malnutrition. Now, we all know dogs can't talk. I mean, I don't know any dog can talk. Maybe they can understand what you're saying, but they can't talk. But the vet who saw this dog knew because of the posturing that this animal was doing that he was malnourished and he was having GI issues. So, you know, maybe some of the things that our kids are displaying are their ways of communicating to us what's going on inside their bodies. And any strategies that you work on behaviorally can be affected if any treatment is left unaddressed. Okay, so again, I want to have pictures of things to look for, maybe for GI distress, okay? Again, 
they'd bend over the end of a couch to relieve distress. That bloated belly, that little boy looks like a malnourished child from Ethiopia. That is not normal. A child's belly should not be descended like that. Okay, this little boy sitting on the potty over there, that's not normal either. Women, when you have a baby, what kind of position do they put you in to get that baby out of you? They prop up your legs like that to help it pass? This little boy is behaving like this to help him pass a bowel movement because he's so impacted and constipated. Again, behavior displaying what the problem is. So, and again, look for immune system dysfunctions. Look for red cheeks. Look for red ears. Look for rashes. Look for signs of detoxification issues. Again, lethargy or hyperactivity. Any changes in any of these things as well. And again, signs of abdominal pain, distress, self-injurious behavior, just anything that is different than what you normally see with that, your child. Because a happier, healthier child is going to be more responsive to behavioral, social, and sensory interventions. When they feel better, they're going to react better. And so the hypothesis that you've heard today over this, the course of this past weekend is that autism is not a psychological condition that it's diagnosed as, but it's actually a metabolic condition resulting from neurogastroimmunological disorder, resulting from a genetic susceptibility and environmental insult. And that these kids have real comorbid conditions that need to be treated. And again, as Martha so eloquently put yesterday during her keynote, is autism a brain disorder or a disorder that's actually affecting the brain? And is there a potential for plasticity, for, for things to recover? So it's this new paradigm shift. And it's real interesting. This picture I pulled off of the uh, mitochondrial disorder group uh, from Mississippi. I'm actually, that's where I live. I live in Mississippi. And I, I just, I always look for different pictures. I like to change up my presentations and stuff. And there was just something really compelling about this little girl. And that's how I feel about every single child with autism. When you look at them, there's just, there's something compelling in there, and we have to help them get out. Um, I wanted to provide this as a recommendation for reading. I had the honor of co-authoring several chapters with this with Stephen Shore. It's an excellent kind of overview of everything related to autism. Uh, he goes over all the different type of therapy interventions, and then there are chapters on biomedical interventions in there too. Actually, half the time when I go to conferences, I read this on the plane to kind of just refresh my memory on everything because I don't do this on a daily basis. I just do consulting when patients call me and during the day, you know, I work for NASA doing whatever they tell me to do. <laughs> so, um, but the take-home lesson is that you need behavioral therapies because developmental milestones are missed, that there are biomedical treatment options, and that you understand why you would use things like supplementation and why you need to address if there are detoxification issues and why you would supplement with cofactors so that you can detoxify. So you understand that biomedical and behavioral interventions must be done together for optimal outcome. Okay, so I know this is how you feel now. But you're going to walk away empowered. You know, you guys got so much great information over this weekend. You know, take your time. Try to be systematic. Try to try one thing at a time. Don't do everything at once. Don't throw the baby in with the bathwater. Because you'll never know what's helping, you know. Um, once you start doing a couple of things and you know it works, then as um, Dr. Van Dyke said, you can kind of cluster those treatments together. But it's a good idea so you know, because what works for one kid doesn't work for another. You can do a diet, it might not work. You can supplement, it could work great for one kid, you can give it to another kid, it doesn't do anything. I mean, and the only way you know if you kind of systematically approach it, even though you're really excited about everything you learned and you want to try everything. And I like to show a montage of photos because a lot of people have claimed that, you know, it's just better diagnosis. And I'm sure in some cases there is a better diagnosis. But there are cases where there is regressive autism and these kids were developing normally. And I can't be told that the pediatrician missed that this was an autistic child. So there, these children here have a period of normal development. This to me does not look like a child that has autism. There's eye contact, they're smiling, there's color to the face, and then something happened. There's that blank stare again. And the pallor is kind of white. You know, it just seems to be getting wor worse. Um, 
The hair doesn't look very healthy. It looks kind of straw-like. There's no consistency to it. Um, this is where I'm talking about if you look at half the face, it almost looks like there's a paralysis going on on half the face. You know, a, a, a something happened to this child. There was some sort of incident. And again, you know, the bags under the eyes, the puffiness to the face, the straw-like hair. I mean, you have to look for these outward signs that are telling you that your children are unwell. And then this child looks much healthier. This child is going to respond better to interventions. And this child is going to make friends. And same thing, I'll show girls and boys. Um, I know there are more boys, but I, I, that was actually my daughter. So, uh, you know, there aren't a lot of girls out there, but I think there are some, and it's always good for some. I mean, there's got to be one person out there in the audience who has a daughter, but that it affects girls as well as boys. And again, this seems like to me a normal developing child. And again, that blank stare, he's gone. The pallor to his face, he's completely out of it. And again, he looks happier and healthier. And more and more autistic children are getting better. They are healing every day. And some children are recovering. Um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that your child's going to recover, but you can make your child so much better. So, you know, even better is better than where you can be at sometimes. You know, you hear those horror stories about the, you know, the stool and the not sleeping, and you can make your life better. It's possible. And we're, we're all hopeful that all these children can be better and avoid having you know, more children get diagnosed. Because like I've been doing this for over 10 years. I can't believe there's a room full of people knowing what I know. You know. I feel like some of this could have been preventable. But if I can make a difference in somebody's life, if I can help empower somebody to do something, to be patient, to be inspired, it's such a challenging job to raise a child with autism. And I have a fuzzy rainbow because there is a rainbow out there. It might not be a clear one, but it's out there. And remember, this is your only time on this planet with this child. I want you to take the time to love and nurture them the best that you can. And I want to read this. Can I read this? Can I read it? OK. So that's the end of my talk, and thank you. Um, I have a friend, and she gave me permission to read this. And it's just really, really moving to me. And I, I, I want to share it for the people who don't think that their child is in there, OK? This was that severely autistic child that I talked about. He's 15 years old now, and he writes with facilitated communication on an alpha smart. I'm not going to say his name, but I'm going to read the question and answers. Why do you carry that laptop around? It is my voice since I can't speak. Is there a reason why you can't speak? I have a condition known as autism, which prevents me from speaking. I've been able to communicate via my computer through a method known as facilitative communication. I need someone to help guide my fingers to a keyboard. There are voice output programs on my computer that serve as my voice. What is autism, and are those numbers rising? Autism is a neurological disorder that affects me socially as well as my ability to communicate. I cannot strike up conversation with anyone because my brain won't let me. Sometimes I do socially unacceptable things. However, I have no control over my actions. Autism is on the rise. One out of, at this time, when he wrote this, 150 people have autism. We don't know the cause. We are all different. This is from this child. I mean, I get goosebumps when I read it. What is that flapping all about? I'm not sure, except I can't help myself. I can release a lot of tension this way. My classmates either ignore it or they tell me to be quiet. I know who my real friends are. What else does autism prevent you from doing? I have trouble with motor planning. I can't get my brain to allow me to initiate anything. I need someone to do this for me. For example, I have to have someone say, how are we going to solve this math problem? Then I'm able to do it. They can't just say do it. This also applies to athletics as well. And this is real interesting, too. I need the same help with throwing a ball or swinging a golf club. I'm very fast, but one must direct me in the right direction. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to do this. You try to play catch with your child, you throw the ball at them, and they just stand there like this. And it bounces off of them. And he basically says, somebody has to tell me, put your hands up, clasp it on the ball, and then they do that, and then they can catch the ball. They need those additional instructions because that inference they don't get. Do you have any other conditions besides autism? Yes, I have epilepsy. 50% of kids with autism have epilepsy. I usually present, um, it usually presents during puberty. My classmates at his school have gotten to witness my first seizure as well as others. 
Is there anything good? This is sad. This, is there anything good about having autism? No, not really, but I can read paragraphs really fast. This child is like brilliant. It's, it's unreal. I'm a visual learner, as most of them are. I don't know why I'm wired this way. Since I can't speak, my brain has compensated by allowing me to write with ease. I've won a statewide essay as well as having a poem published. I missed writing for this particular newspaper this year. I think everyone looked forward to reading my columns. So he wrote a column for a particular newspaper. What do you want people to know about you? I may act like a strange kid, but I am much more interesting. I am very unique in that I am extremely intelligent for someone who has autism. Unfortunately, my behaviors that I can't control give people the wrong impression. I'm very frustrated about having autism. It's like being trapped in solitary confinement, like from the picture I showed you at the beginning. Imagine not being able to speak for one day. This is my life every second, every minute, every hour, every day, every month, every year for 15 years. So just remember that they're in there and help them, help your child. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I hope I helped somebody. <laughs>